Okay, good afternoon. Uh, we will continue defining the semantics of Haskell. So what have we done up to now? So in, in the first part of uh, this chapter on the semantics of Haskell, we looked at the values that we need for the semantics. So the idea of the denotation of semantics is we map every Haskell expression and every Haskell program to some mathematical object. And the first question was, well, what kind of mathematical objects will we use? And, well, we decided to take more or less the values that you would expect plus something to denote undefined or partially undefined values denoted by bottom. So in section 211, uh, the idea was what kind of values do we need for defining the semantics? And well, we had things like z bottom and, uh, and so on. So we had this, this bottom element for undefinedness. But when we looked at functions, it turned out that we don't need all the functions that go from one domain like this to another domain. Uh, but it's, it's sufficient to restrict ourselves to certain functions with nice properties, namely the monotonic and continuous functions. So, so values for function domains. And here the observation was that not all functions are computable, and we can restrict ourselves to monotonic and, in fact, even to continuous functions. And so now we know how the domains look like. And now we will define the mapping. If we have a function, a Haskell function, which is a kind of syntactic expression, to what kind of mathematical object, so to which actual function are we going to map it? And this is the topic of the lecture today. And to do this, we will use the concept of fixed points. And that's the reason for the name of this section. So what's the goal? The goal is map every Haskell function, which is just a syntactical expression following certain rules, map each of these expressions, these function expressions, to some real mathematical function, to really a function that takes, for example, objects from Z bottom and returns an object from Z bottom. Every Haskell function expression to an actual mathematical function. So this is the goal. And the question is, how can we do this? So the, the problem is, how do we determine this mathematical function? I mean, if we have this function text in Haskell, how can we define, well, this function text corresponds to this actual mathematical function. So how to determine the respective mathematical function for every function expression in Haskell? How to determine the respective mathematical function. Well, to, to show the problem, let's start with an easy example, namely with a function that has no recursion. That's the easy case. So the first example is easy. That's a function expression without recursion. without recursion. So for example, let's take the following Haskell function, which converts Boolean to integers. So it converts the Boolean true to the integer 1 and the Boolean false to the integer 0. I mean, that could be useful because sometimes you want to encode Booleans by integers. So let's call this convert. So this goes from bool to int. And how is this defined? Well, it's a function. I, I will write these function for simplicity in, in this way that I just have the function name here and I have a lambda expression on the right-hand side. So that's a function that takes some Boolean b 
And well, if b is true, then it returns 1. And if b is false, then it returns 0. So if b is true, then 1 else 0. OK, so this is a legal Haskell function. And a function expression is a syntactical thing. And how do we determine the mathematical function that belongs to this? Well, the semantics of this function expression conf of conf should be a mathematical function. Should be some function well, that's should be some function f or well let's let's call it this. It should be some function phi conf. And this fun function phi conf, uh, from which domain to which domain should this, should this go? So what, what arguments would it expect? Well, we know already the domain for the data type bool. The domain for bool is b bottom. So this should go from b bottom. And we know the domain for int, which is z bottom. So this should go to z bottom. So someone told me I should write z like this. So I'm not sure whether I can get used to this, but let's try. Uh, okay, so it should go from B bottom to Z bottom. Okay, and well, okay, that's clear from the type. And now, how does the function look like? Well, the nice thing is that on the right hand side of this function definition, there are only predefined functions. So there is true and one and zero and equals and if then else. So this is all predefined. So we can assume that we defined the semantics of all this predefined stuff in advance then it should not be difficult to come up with semantics. So on the right-hand side of, conf, of the conf definition or conf declaration, we only have predefined functions or predefined uh, language constructs. We only have predefined uh, functions and constructs whose semantics, well, is already predefined as well. So whose semantics uh, is already known. Whose semantics is known. So for example, the, this expression is mapped to the number 1 from Z bottom. And this expression is mapped to the, tr to the value true from b bottom and so on. And, and this is mapped to the equality function, where uh, if one of the two arguments is bottom, then uh, it also returns bottom. So then, uh, then the semantics of conf can easily be inferred. Can easily be inferred. So how should this mathematical function phi conf look like? Well, it takes a value from b bottom, so true, false, or bottom, and it returns something. So what should it return? Well, if b is, so there are three possibilities. Either b is true, or false, or bottom. If b is true, well, then it should return 1. If b is false, then it should return 0. And if b is bottom, then it should return bottom. So this is the bottom, uh, the bottom element of z bottom. And this happens if b is the bottom element of b bottom. Now, this is what you would expect. but uh, well, this is the easy case because conf has no recursion. Now, what happens if we have recursion? So let's look at another example. But now a more challenging example, namely one with recursion. recursion. So now we have an example with recursion. And of course, 
almost all interesting functions in Haskell have recursion. So let's look at the factorial function. So the factorial function goes from int to int in Haskell. And how would we define it? Well, that's the function that takes a number x. And well, let's assume the factorial of negative numbers is 1. So if x is smaller or equal to 0, then it returns 1. And else, uh, fact calls itself recursively with fact of x minus 1 and multiplies the result with x. So that's, the, that's a natural definition of the factorial function. OK, so what should be the semantics of fact then? So the semantics of fact should be some mathematical function. Uh, phi fact should be a mathematical function phi fact. And it's clear what is the argument type and what is the result type, because here we have int and the domain for int is at bottom. So this should go from z bottom to z bottom. But now the question is, how does this function phi fact really look like? Well, if we do it in the way that we did it above, I mean, above we had the idea, well, let's determine the semantics of the right-hand side. So let's determine the semantics of this expression. And that was possible because we know the semantics of equals, we know the semantics of true and of one and of zero. So let's determine the semantics of the right-hand side. And then we simply say, OK, uh, then the semantics of the left-hand side should be the same as the semantics of the right-hand side. So what we did before was first determine the semantics of the right-hand side of the declaration. Determine the semantics of the right-hand side, which was easy in the example above. And then, well, assign this semantics also to the left-hand side. Assign this semantics also to the left-hand side, which means, in our example, assign this to fact, i.e. to fact. Now, in the example above, this was possible. We could simply determine the semantics of the right-hand side because it contains nothing unknown. But here we have a problem, because if we want to determine the semantics of the right-hand side, so of this expression, then the problem is that fact occurs in here. And we don't know the semantics of fact yet. We want to determine the semantics of fact. Now, up there, this was nice because there was nothing unknown in the right-hand side. But here, there is something unknown in the right-hand side, namely this function symbol whose semantics we just want to determine. So we don't know it yet. And that's, that's the problem. So the problem is that the right-hand side contains this function symbol fact whose semantics we don't know yet. I mean, that's what we want to determine. Uh, we do not know yet. So this is bad. And now the question is how to solve this problem. And I will present two solutions to you. So I will present two solutions to this problem. And I hope that both solutions sound plausible, that this could be reasonable ways to define the semantics. And then we will see that both solutions are equivalent. So both lead to the same uh, definition in the end. So present two solutions and then, then show that both solutions yield the same result. Yield 
the same result. So that's the plan for the lecture today, to look at these two solutions. OK, so how do we solve this problem? How can we define the semantics of fact? So solution one. OK, so the problem is that this is a recursive definition. And I mean, that's, that's the reason why this fact occurs in the right-hand side. And if, there, if this were not recursive, we could proceed as we did for conf. We would already know the semantics of the right-hand side. And we could simply say, well, this known semantics of the right-hand side, we assign this function also to the left-hand side. And so one solution is, let's replace this recursive definition by a number of non-recursive definitions, and then proceed in the same way as we did it for conf. So solution one is replace the recursive fact definition. So replace the recursive definition of the factorial function by a sequence of non-recursive definitions. Of non-recursive definitions. And for these non-recursive definitions, well, we know how to determine the semantics. We do it just as we did it for conf. And proceed for them as, uh, as for conf. as in the example conf. OK, so how can, we, how can we do this? I want to replace this factorial function definition by many non-recursive ones. And to do this, uh, I will use an additional, well, definition, an additional function which is always undefined. So here we use an additional constant constant bot, uh, and this bot that should be a, a function in Haskell, and it should be mapped to uh, the value bottom with. with the semantics z bot, the bottom element of z bottom. So bot could be defined like this. Bot is an integer, and it is defined by this nice definition, bot equals bot. So this would have the semantics uh, always undefined, and it's the undefined value of z bottom. OK, now how? Can I replace the factorial function by a sequence of non-recursive definitions? Well, the first definition, fact 0, is a kind of approximation to this definition. It's a very bad approximation. It's also a function from int to int, but it maps every number to bottom. So this is the function which takes an x and maps it to bot. So I mean, this is a legal Haskell definition. Fact 0 is a function from int to int. Now, clearly, this is not recursive. I mean, fact 0 is not called on the right-hand side. So if we know what the semantics of bot is, then we can also easily determine what the semantics of fact underscore 0 is. Now, fact 1 is a little better approximation. Fact 1 looks almost like fact. So let's copy the definition. So it's a function that takes an x. Uh, if x is less than or equal to 0, then we return 1. Else, well, up to now, we had a recursive call at this point. We called fact at this point. Now we don't call fact 1, because we want to make it non-recursive. So instead of fact 1, we call the previous approximation. We call fact 0. So else, fact 0 of x minus 1 
times x. Now, if we know already the semantics of fact 0, then we can compute the semantics of this right-hand side. And then we know the semantics of this right-hand side, and we can say, OK, the semantics of fact 1 should be the semantics of this right-hand side. Now, you can imagine how fact 2 looks like. But if you can't, then I'll write it down. So uh, this looks almost like fact until we arrive at the recursive call. And now we don't call fact 2 recursively, but we call the previous approximation. We call fact 1. And so on. So this is a sequence of non-recursive definitions, clearly. I mean, you can easily see they are non-recursive. And now we can determine the semantics, because we know the semantics of this right-hand side. Hence, we can assign the semantics to this. Then we know the semantics of this right-hand side, so we can assign the semantics of this right-hand side to this left-hand side, and so on. So let's do it. So what are the what is the semantics of this? So the semantics of all these functions of all fact n can be determined easily because they are all defined in a non-recursive way. Since they are all defined non-recursively. OK, so what is the semantics of fact 0? So we get a lot of mathematical functions, and they all go from z bottom to z bottom. So let's determine the semantics. What's the semantics of fact 0? Well, if we already know the semantics of bot, which is uh, the bottom element of z bottom, then the semantics of this right-hand side is the function that maps every argument x to bottom. So this must be the function that maps every x to bottom. Now what's the semantics of fact 1? What's the semantics of fact 1? That's also a function from z bottom to z bottom. And uh, well, here we have to distinguish several cases. If x is if x is negative, then the result here is 1. So if x is negative, then the result is 1. I mean, we know what less than or equal means. We know what 1 means. We know what times means. We know what minus means. And we know what fact 0 means, namely, uh, this function here. So if x is negative, then we get 1. If x is 0, then we get 1 as well. And otherwise, we get this thing over here. What's this thing? Well, uh, this is fact 0 of x minus 1. Now, fact 0 always returns bottom. And the semantics of the multiplication in Haskell is strict. So as soon as one argument is bottom, the result is bottom as well. So in other words, for 0, we get 1. And for more positive numbers than 0, we get bottom. So we get bottom as soon as uh, x is bottom or uh, x is greater or equal to 1. And otherwise, we get 1. Well, in fact, this is only the case where x is 0. Let me write it like this. Uh, this holds if x is greater or equal to 0, but smaller than 1. That's a 
complicated way of writing x equals 0. But why write it like this uh, will become obvious in a minute. Now, what's the semantics of fact 2? Now, clearly, for negative numbers, it's still 1. Clearly, for bottom, it's still bottom, if x is bottom. And now what happens for 0? Well, for 0, we get 1. What happens for 1? If x is 1, then we move in here. 1 minus 1 is 0. And fact 1 of 0, fact 1 of 0 is uh, the factorial of 0. So uh, it will be defined for 1 but it will not be defined for two or greater numbers. So it turns out that this computes the factorial if x is between 0 and 2, but if x is greater than 2 or equal to 2, then it returns the bottom, and so on. And we have seen these functions before. We called them fact 0, fact 1, fact 2, and so on. So these are exactly the functions that we have seen uh, in an earlier lecture. And, well, we have seen that these functions, they approximate the factorial function. So they get nearer and nearer to the factorial function. I mean, this is defined nowhere. So this is always undefined. But this is defined for x smaller or equal to 0. This one is defined for x's that are smaller or equal to 1, and so on. So the set of numbers where uh, the function is defined increases from each approximation to the next. And therefore, this builds a chain. So this corresponds to what we called fact 0, fact 1, and so on in an earlier lecture. And therefore, they built a chain. So this very bad approximation is less defined or equal to this approximation, which is a little better. And this is less defined or equal to the next approxima approximation, which is even better, and so on. So they form a chain. And well, what was our goal? Our goal was to find out how can we define the semantics of the factorial function. And the the solution, or solution number one, is let's replace the factorial definition by a sequence of non-recursive definitions. Let's compute the semantics for each of these non-recursive definitions, and then take the lemmas of this chain. And lemmas means the least upper bound. So take the least upper bound of this chain, and then define that the least upper bound of this chain is the semantics of fact. So. Define the semantics of fact as the least upper bound of this chain. So we would say that the semantics of fact is the least upper bound of the chain. Where we take the semantics of this very bad approximation the semantics of the next approximation, and so on. And well, why does this make sense? Well, that makes sense because if you look at these definitions, uh, at these uh, functions up here, how, how do they correspond to the original function, the original factorial function? Well, they do the same as the original factorial function, so fact n. is like fact, provided that we do not need uh, more than, I mean, this, this n tells us how often we may call fact recursively. So it's like fact, but. Uh, if we need n 
or more recursive calls, then it's suddenly not like fact anymore, but then it returns uh, bottom. Of fact, then it stops and returns, then it returns bottom. So this is like a version of fact which counts the number of recursive calls. And as soon as the number of recursive calls reaches n or exceeds n, then this stops and returns bottom. So fact zero only works like fact if we do not need zero recursive calls or more. I mean, so this never works like fact. This always returns bottom. This one works like fact as long as we do not need one or more recursive calls. So as long as we can evaluate without recursive calls, this does the right thing. But as soon as we reach a recursive call, it returns bottom. This one works like fact, but it allows only one recursive call. As soon as we need two recursive calls, we get bottom. And similarly for fact three, fact four, and so on. So this is like fact, but the number of allowed recursive calls is limited. And if you exceed this limit, it returns bottom. And well, if we move high enough, then uh, we get a better and better approximation of fact. So that's the intuition why this kind of definition makes sense. So that sounds, I hope, like a convincing way to define the semantics of recursively defined functions like fact. And uh, now I will present you a different solution to define the semantics of fact. And then afterwards, we will see that both solutions lead to the same result. So before I, I show you the second solution, let's maybe think about how these, these functions, fact 0, 5 fact 0, 5 fact 1, and so on, how they, how they are connected. How do we get from one approximation to the next? So how does one get from one approximation, so let's say from phi fact n to the next approximation to phi fact n plus 1? So could one define a function which, if you give it one approximation, it computes for you the next approximation? Yes, we can define a function which refines approximations, so which gets this approximation as input and gives you this approximation as, as result. So how would, this, how would this work? Well, we can define some function ff, and ff takes one approximation as input and it gives you the next approximation. So it takes a function as input. So this is a function which goes from z bottom to z bottom. And it returns to you another function that uh, again goes from z bottom to z bottom. So the whole thing, this whole thing is again a function from z bottom to z bottom. So it's a function that takes an integer or, a, uh, or the value bottom. And well, how does this work? If you, if you look at the definition of these functions again, what does it do? If we already have an approximation, so we already have an approximation like this, how do we get the next one? Well, the next one is a function that looks at the number, checks whether the number is smaller or equal to 0, and then it returns 1. So if it's smaller or equal to 0, then it returns 1. So it returns 1 if x is smaller or equal to 0. And otherwise, it, you take the previous approximation, call it with the argument x minus 1, and multiply the whole thing with x. So if this was the previous approximation, and we want to compute the next approximation, we take the previous approximation, apply it to x minus 1, and multiply the whole thing with x. So this is how we get from one approximation to the next. So in other words, we now have that ff of the bottom function of fact 0 
is fact one. Sorry, five ff of phi fact zero is the function phi fact one. And similarly, ff of phi fact one is fact two and so on. And you can even define this function ff in Haskell. So how would that look like? The function ff can also be defined in Haskell. Because what, what does this function do? It takes one approximation to the factorial function and gives you the next approximation, which allows one more recursive call. And otherwise, it behaves uh, like the factorial function. So how would ff look like in Haskell? It would be a function that takes one approximation to the factorial function, so something like fact 0. And it gives you back the next approximation, so something like fact 1. And how would this look like? So ff takes one function which goes from int to int, which is already an approximation to factorial. And it gives you back, well, the same thing that we have on the right-hand side here. But as soon as we reach the former recursive call, we take the former approximation. So we take g. So if g was the previous approximation, then the next approximation is the following function. It's the function that maps the number x. Well, if x is smaller or equal to 0, then it maps it to 1. And else, it maps it to g of x minus 1 times x. And with this, with this function, we can now, we now see how to get all these Approximation. So if we start with fact zero, I mean fact zero is the function that is undefined everywhere. So I mean fact zero is the bottom function. That's the bottom element of z bottom to z bottom. So that's the most undefined function that we have in this uh, domain. So in other words, if we apply ff zero times to this bottom function, then uh, we get phi of fact 0. If we apply ff one time to this bottom function, we get phi of fact 1. If we apply ff twice to the bottom function, so this means ff, so this means ff applied to ff applied to bottom, we get phi of fact 2 and so on. So in other words, this ff function is simply the function that replaces left, the left-hand side of the factorial definition by the right-hand side. So if, if this was the left-hand side, then this is the corresponding right-hand side, where the only difference is that we replace the recursive call by, by g. OK, so this is some more. Uh, reasoning about these, these functions, fact 0, fact 1, fact 2, and so on. And now let's uh, come to the second solution, how one could solve this problem of defining the semantics of recursively defined function. So solution 2, in order to define the semantics of recursively defined functions like fact. of recursively defined functions like fact. Well, this, the second solution has the following intuition. 
if we look at this, this definition, then we can regard it as a kind of constraint. So this more or less describes a property that the function fact has to satisfy. It has to satisfy this equation. In other words, the function fact has to satisfy that it is exactly, the function fact is exactly the same as the stuff over there. I mean, fact occurs both here and there. But if I insert the real function fact, then this equation has to be fulfilled. So this equation is, is regarded as a kind of constraint, and it must hold for the real factorial function. So the idea is regard the function definition of fact as a kind of constraint and the semantics of fact has to satisfy this constraint. So, so the semantics of fact, which is this mathematical function, this function has to satisfy this constraint. Has to satisfy this constraint. In other words, we can also express this, this intuition using this function ff, because was, what does ff do? ff maps any function g to the right-hand side of the factorial definition, but uh, instead of fact, I wrote g. So in other words, this function transforms the left-hand side of the factorial definition into the right-hand side. So what we do is, we uh, search for a function phi of fact which satisfies the following constraint. Fact must be the same thing, phi, sorry, phi of fact must be the same thing as the right hand side of the factorial definition if we replace this recursive call by the function phi fact. So it should be the same thing as ff of phi fact. I mean, ff of phi fact, what does this mean? That's the function that ff of phi fact, that's the function that returns 1 if x is negative or 0, and it returns phi fact of x minus 1 times x otherwise. In other words, this expresses that phi fact must be a function that corresponds to the declaration of the factorial function. The left-hand side must be identical to the right-hand side. And something like this is called a fixed point. A fixed point, so this means, in other words, phi fact should be a fixed point of ff. A fixed point, in general, a fixed point of a function is an object that is mapped to itself. And we would like to find a function which is a fixed point of ff. So ff, which is the function that maps left-hand side of the fact declaration to the right-hand side, this ff function must have phi fact as a fixed point. Uh, let me wipe the board and then I'll get it. So in general, we say, If we have a function, then we say x is a fixed point of a function of a function f if f of x equals x. So this, this means fixed point. Fixed point means some object is mapped to itself. And in our example, this function f is slightly complicated because it maps functions to functions. And we look for a fixed point of this ff function. Now, could it be that for, for some function definitions, there are not just one of these fixed points, but many of these fixed points? And uh, 
Yes, indeed, this could happen. So could there be function declarations in Haskell where, which are ambiguous in the sense that many functions satisfy the defining equation. Where several functions satisfy the corresponding uh, equation. And the answer is yes. And here is an example. Let's look at another example to, to illustrate this with one more example. So this is a function non-term, and as the name suggests, it's not terminating. It should also be a function from int to int. And it's defined like this. Non-term is the function that maps any integer x to non-term of x plus 1. Now, if we want to define the semantics in the same way as uh, we did it up there, then the goal is we search for a function. We search for a function phi of a non-term that satisfies this equation. So phi of non-term should be the same as the function that maps x to phi non-term of x plus 1. For a function which satisfies the defining equation, In other words, uh, we look for something where phi of non-term x is the same as the function is the same as the function that maps x to phi of non-term x plus one. So, uh, in other words, this means we search for a function where phi of non-term x is the same as phi of non-term x plus 1. And uh, if we want to express this in the same way as above, here we have this function ff, which transforms left-hand side to right-hand side. And we can define a similar function here as well. So let's call it nn instead of ff. So a function nn, which transforms the left-hand side into the right-hand side, which transforms the left-hand side of the non-term declaration into the right-hand side. So this function nn would take one approximation to non-term and return a slightly better approximation to non-term. So how would this look like? It would take one approximation of non-term, so a function from int to int, and give you back the next approximation to non-term, which is also from int to int. So nn takes some function g as an input. This is the previous approximation of non-term. And what does it return? Well, it's the function. Uh, it's the function that goes from x to g of x plus 1. And so uh, if we want to have this, then we look for a fixed point of nn. So the goal is. 
we search for a fixed point of Nn. In other words, this function that we look for should satisfy that phi of that Nn applied to phi of non-term is the same as phi of non-term. And the question is, which function satisfies this? Or are there several functions that satisfy this? Mm -hmm. Any constant function satisfies this. So any constant function will satisfy this. I mean, it just says that the function should, if I apply the function to x, it should return the same thing as if I apply it to x plus 1. And that should hold for all x's. In other words, this is satisfied by every constant function. In other words, every constant function is a fixed point of nn. So for this example, we have several fixed points. And this is satisfied by every constant function. And so this is an example where this equation, in that sense, is not unique. Because, for example, the function that returns 17 for every input will satisfy this. I mean, 17 of x is clearly the same as, as the 17 function applied to x plus 1. And so this could be the semantics of this function definition. But of course, that's not what we want. I mean, why should it return 17? So what should be the semantics? What, what of the, which one of the constant functions should we choose as the semantics here? The, the constant function that always returns 17, or the one that always returns 0? Or, I mean, if you look at this, what, what do you think will be the semantics of this? Yes? The function that always returns bottom. Right. It should be the function that always returns bottom. And that's, of course, also a constant function. And well, how do we find this? The solution is this is the smallest of all the fixed points. This is the least fixed point, the smallest fixed point that we have. And that's the one that we choose. So. Choose the least of all these fixed points. Choose the least fixed point uh, as the desired semantics. Phi of non-term. And well, the motivation is, I mean, least in the sense of less defined or equal. So in other words, this means this is as undefined as possible. So this is only defined if this is really required by the definition. And if the definition leaves open whether it's defined or not, then it should be undefined. I mean, this, this equality is not violated by the function that always returns 17, but there is no reason to return 17. It is not required by this equation. So if it's not required, if it can be avoided that something defined is returned, then let's return undefined. So the result should only be defined if this is required by the definition, by the function declaration. If this is required by the function declaration, declaration, otherwise it should be undefined. Otherwise, it should be undefined. So the solution will be phi of non-term will be a constant function, but it's the function that always returns bottom. And so this is the, the second solution. The second solution is let's take the function like ff for factorial or nn for non-term, which transforms left-hand sides to right-hand sides and take the least fixed point of this function. So the second solution is take the function that transforms left-hand sides to right-hand sides or that transforms one approximation 
uh, to the next approximation that transforms the left-hand side of the function declaration to the right-hand side. So this is a function like ff or nn. The left-hand side of the declaration to the right-hand side or respectively that transforms one approximation one approximation like phi fact n to the next so to phi fact n plus 1 and define the semantics of the examined function as the least fixed point of this function. Define the semantics as the least fixed point LFP for short of this function. So the second solution in our example for the factorial function would therefore mean the semantics of the factorial function should be the least fixed point of this function ff. This function ff, this was the one that transforms uh, the left hand side to the right hand side and well phi fact should be a fixed point of ff and we have seen that it should be the least fixed point. Well, in the factorial example, it only has one fixed point, but we have seen that there are other examples where we have many fixed points, and then we should take the smallest one. So the second solution tells us, if we want to know the semantics of factorial, then take this higher order function ff, which transforms left-hand sides to right-hand sides, and take its least fixed point. And the first solution said, no, you should do it differently. You should... Uh, define the semantics as the least upper bound of this chain phi fact 0, phi fact 1, phi fact 2, and so on. And, well, they can also be expressed with this higher order function ff. This was ff applied 0 times to bottom, ff applied 1 time to bottom, ff applied 2 times to bottom, and so on. So this is ff applied i times to bottom where i goes from 0 to uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. So this was the first solution for the semantics, and this was the second solution for the semantics. And both sound more or less intuitive. And, well, it will turn out that this is the same. So this and this indeed is the same. And this is a fundamental theorem, which is already pretty old. This is the so-called fixed point theorem. So this is no contradiction, but they are the same. And this statement that the least fixed point of such a higher order function always exists and can be computed in this way. We simply take this chain. So we, if we want to know the least fixed point of a function, we take the chain where we apply the function 0 times to bottom, 1 times to bottom, 2 times to bottom, 3 times to bottom, and so on and we take the least upper bound of this chain, that this is the least fixed point, that's the fixed point theorem, and that's uh, what we still want to prove today. So this is the fundamental theorem that uh, is behind the semantics of uh, programming languages, and it tells us that if we want to know what is the semantics of a recursively defined function, we can take these approximations and build their least upper bound, or we can take the function that maps left-hand side to right-hand side and take its least fixed point, and this stuff is the same. So this is theorem 2117, the so-called fixed point theorem. Which is uh, due to Kleene and Tarski. from 1952, so this is not brand new. 
and it tells us the following. So, I mean, what we do is we, when we speak of least fixed point or when we speak of least upper bound, we mean this less defined or equal relation, which is a complete partial order. So, we have some complete partial order, a complete partial order on some domain D, and let f be continuous. So we have some function f, which is this ff up here. This is continuous. And then the claim is, uh, then f has a least fixed point. And it doesn't only have a fixed, least fixed point, but the theorem also tells us how to compute it. And we have that the least fixed point of f can be obtained by applying f to bottom once, twice, three times, and so on. And we take the least upper bound of the resulting chain. So this is the, the fixed point theorem. And so in our example, what does this mean? If we want to know the semantics of the factorial function, we can build this higher order function ff. And now do we know that ff is continuous? Yes, ff is continuous because, I mean, every computable function is continuous. And ff is computable for sure because we can program it in Haskell. And, well, not only in Haskell, but we can, we can write a program that computes it. So ff must be computable, therefore ff is continuous. Therefore, this least fixed point exists, and it's the same as this. It's the least upper bound of this chain. And this theorem is not difficult to prove. And so we can do this after I wipe the board. OK, let's prove this. So there are, what do we have to show? We have to show that if we have a continuous function, then uh, the least fixed point is this. Now, the first thing that we have to show is why does this set have a least upper bound? So that's the, the first question. So that's the first part that we want to prove. This set here really has a least upper bound. Has a least upper bound. Why does this thing have a least upper bound? Now, uh, what, what do we know? When, when do least upper bounds exist? Mm -hmm. Right, yes, it's a CPO. It's a complete partial order, and complete helps us. So what does complete mean? Right, every chain has a least upper bound. That's what we know by completeness. So what we have to show is that this is a chain. If this is a chain, then by completeness of this ordering, it has a least upper bound. So, so this is what we want to show. Uh, so it suffices to show that this is a chain, that this is, is a chain. Then it must also have a least of a bound because this ordering is complete. Then it has a least upper bound since the ordering is complete. OK, so we have to show that this is a chain. And chain means that I can order the elements such that they become more and more defined. So, so we want to show that, uh, well, if I apply f0 times, then this is less defined than if I apply it once. And this is less defined or equal if I apply it twice, and so on. And in other words, what we want to show is we want to show that f, if I apply it i times, then it is less defined or equal to uh, the case when I applied i plus 1 times for all i.
Now, how can I show something like this? Mm -hmm. yes, uh, Okay, so this principle, someone said it already, is called induction. So that's the solution. So we do induction on i. So whenever we want to show something for all natural numbers, chances are 95% that you apply induction. Okay, so what's the induction? Uh, What's the induction base case? Well, I would say it's sufficient to prove it for i equals 0, and then we prove it if it holds for i, and then it also holds for i plus 1. So let's, let's look at the case where i is 0. So here we have to show that uh, if I apply f0 times to bottom, then this is less defined or equal than if I apply f once to bottom. Now, applying f0 times to bottom is bottom. Well, and bottom is less defined or equal to anything, so uh, bottom is the smallest element of the ordering, so that's fine. That holds. And in the induction step, let's say i is greater than 0. And let's assume I know that it already holds for i minus 1, and then I prove it for i. So the induction hypothesis tells me that uh, f of i minus 1, if I applied i minus 1 times to bottom, then it's less defined or equal to uh, f applied i times to bottom. And now what do I want to show? I want to show this. So how do I get from here to there? Mm -hmm. By monotonicity, right. So I know that f is continuous. And in the last lecture, we showed that continuity implies monotonicity. And therefore, so f is continuous. Then we know that f is monotonic. This was a lemma, lemma two, uh, not lemma, t theorem, theorem 2115. So this was theorem 2115a. And therefore, I can apply f to both sides of this inequality, and this still holds. So this implies that if I apply f on the left-hand side, so I get f applied i times to bottom, and I apply f on the right-hand side, then I get f applied i plus 1 times to bottom, then this holds as well. OK, so we have shown that this indeed holds. So this is a chain, and therefore, it has a least upper bound. So this was part one of the proof. Now part two is, uh, well, we want to prove that the least upper bound of this chain is a fixed point. So we have to show that the least upper bound of this chain is a fixed point of f that it's the least fixed point that will be proved in part three. So this is a fixed point of f. Now, what does fixed point mean? Fixed point means that if I apply f to this argument, then I get this argument as a result. So we have to show if I apply f to this thing here, to this least upper bound, then I get this thing here as a result. So this is really a fixed point. This is mapped to itself. So this is the same thing. OK, so why does this hold? Well, let's, let's try to apply it. If I apply f to this thing over here, to this least upper bound, what can I do now? So applying a function to a least upper bound, 
And I know a little bit about this function. I know that it is continuous. And this was not required by accident, but this was required on purpose. So what, what does continuous mean? Mm -hmm. Right. It means that I can, ex can swap this. So instead of first applying least upper bound and then applying f, I can turn this around. So this is the same as taking the least upper bound and applying f to every element in there. So I apply f to every element in there. Since f is continuous, and well, this just means I apply f to every element here. So I have f applied i plus 1 times to bottom. So in other words, it's the least upper bound of, well, if i is 0, then I have f of bottom. If i is uh, 1, then I have f applied to twice to bottom, and so on. Now, what do I want? I want that this is equal to this. So here I have the least upper bound of this set. And well, this set here is almost the same as this set, except that one element is missing. Bottom is missing. I mean, here I could be 0, and then I have bottom. Whereas here, if i is 0, then I have f of bottom. So bottom is not there. Now, what happens if I add bottom in here? Will this change anything? No, because I take the least upper bound of this large infinite set. And if I add the smallest element that there is, so if I add bottom to it, then nothing will change. The least upper bound will remain unchanged. So it's no problem. I can simply add bottom, and this will not uh, modify this in any way. So let's add bottom. And then, of course, this is what I want. So this, indeed, is the least upper bound of f applied i times to bottom, where i is any number from the naturals. And this shows that uh, this is indeed a fixed point of f. And well, part three will be the last task. Now we have to show that this is not any fixed point, but it's the least fixed point. OK, so the last part of the proof is we have to show that this thing is the least fixed point. In other words, let's take another uh, fixed point and show that this thing is smaller or equal than any other fixed point. So this thing here is uh, smaller or equal smaller or equal <coughs> than any other fixed point of f. So this is what we will show in the last part of the proof. OK, so how can we show it? Well, let's assume there's another fixed point. So let d be another fixed point of f. And we have to show that this fixed point that we already found is less than or equal to d. So we have to show that this thing here uh, this thing is less than or equal to d. And well, here we have to show that, I mean, this d must be an upper bound to the least upper bound of this set. Now, this could be simplified. Let's simply show that d is an upper bound to this set. So it suffices to show that d is some upper bound bound of this set fi 
slide to bottom, I times. Because if, if d is an upper bound of the set, then for sure the least upper bound will be smaller or equal to d. So we have to show that all the elements in here are smaller or equal than d. So what we have to show is all the elements in here, fi bottom, they are smaller or equal to d for all natural numbers i. OK, if we show this, then we know that d is an upper bound of the set, and therefore the least upper bound must be smaller or equal to d. Now, how can we show this? There's again, for all i from n, for all natural numbers i. If we want to prove something for all natural numbers, what do we do in 95, maybe even in 99% of the examples? We use induction. So we do use induction again. So we do induction on i. So the induction base case is again the case where i is 0. So here we have to show that if I apply f0 times to bottom, then the result is less than or equal to d. Well, if I apply f0 times to bottom, then I get the smallest element bottom. So this is true for sure. This will hold. And what happens if i is greater than 0 in the induction step case? So here i is greater than 0. Now what we know is the induction hypothesis. The induction hypothesis tells us that this statement is already true for i minus 1. So if I apply f i minus 1 times, then this is less than or equal to d. And we have to show that this also holds if I apply f i times. How can I do this? Mm -hmm. OK, by monotonicity, since f is monotonic, because it's continuous, therefore it's also monotonic. So I can apply f on both sides of the uh, inequation, and this still holds. So let's do this. Then I have f i times here, and there I have f of d. But I want d. Mm -hmm. uh, f, d is a fixed point of f, so we can have plus i d. Right, exactly. So f of d is d, since d is a fixed point of f. And that's what we wanted. So now we have shown that all of these fi bottoms are less than or equal to d. And therefore, d, in fact, must be greater or equal to this least fixed point. So this is really the least fixed point. So this uh, theorem has a quite nice proof, which is not too complicated. And, uh, and this, in fact, is, is the, the deep theorem, which is at the heart of the denotational semantics of, uh, well, not only functional programming, but in fact also imperative programming. There, it's essentially the same idea. So for functional programming, the idea is really if you have a recursively defined function, then regard the function declaration as a higher order function, which maps the left-hand side to the right-hand side, and look for the smallest function that satisfies it. So for the least fixed point, the smallest fixed point, such that uh, the function that maps left-hand sides to right-hand sides has, has this function as a fixed point. OK, so this is something to get used to. And well, we will repeat this again throughout the course. And we'll continue on Friday. So see you there. <laughs>